Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth webinar in our series of food strategy for your city. It's a pleasure to have you all joining us today from across the world. In today's webinar, we are going to be looking at engaging stakeholders in your strategy and the creation and design of your strategy from citizens to farmers to health professionals and more. So we are now recording our webinar, so please do keep your cameras off if you do not wish to be recorded. And please do use the chat function, as I said, to, to introduce yourselves and say hello to one another and also to put any questions that you have to our speakers um, in the box. We'll have some Q&A um, at the end as well. We're going to kick off with our first speakers. We'll do a slightly different um, uh, arrangement of speakers today. We are going to be starting with um, uh, rolling our knowledge speaker and our first case study into one presentation between three speakers. So we have first up uh, our very uh, lovely colleague, Charlene Milou, who many of you will already know and recognize. She's a special advisor on city food policy with us at the Food Foundation, and she's the engagement lead for the Food Cities 2022 project. She's a qualified nutritionist and works on a number of international city food projects. And speaking after Charlene, we have Dr. Anjani Rao and Bushana Karandika. Dr. Rao has over 20 years of experience in health and nutrition related research, and she's been involved in various national and international food systems related projects, in particular focusing her work on maternal and child health. And Bushana Karandika is a postgraduate in economics and an ex-civil servant. She's had a really interesting varied career spanning the global food trade, horticulture value chains, pharma networks, food safety regulations, and biofortified food across the last 30 years. And they're going to be talking to us about engaging citizens in, um, in the development of your strategy. So I'm going to hand um, straight over to Charlene to start us off. Thanks, Charlene. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Can you all see that? Yep. Is that a thumbs up, Florence? Yeah. It started screen sharing. We can't see the, oh, there we are. Yes, we've got it. Okay, so um, stakeholder and citizen engagement is absolutely key to developing city food policy or city region food policy. And in our very first um, uh, at the recordings that we did at the, at the start of the webinar series, I'm just sharing the, the a couple of slides from that. So we know that the aim of a city-led food strategy is to ensure food safety, which a lot of you are very focused on, security, so ensuring that everybody has access to food, and sustainability in terms of sustainability for health, the planet, economic sustainability, which we covered previously. And we aim to do this through three levers of change. And today, what we're really focusing on is the collaboration side. So who is it that we're going to be collaborating with, whether we're trying to develop a, a, a full city food policy or implement specific food policy actions? So we also mentioned that initial steps include securing senior leadership or political buy-in. Because if our aim is to make policy change, then we need to ensure that there's a governance structure that we report through to enable that to happen. But as important as engaging food system actors, so I'm going to cover who some of those food system actors are and those that are also missing often from the discussion in order to understand the food issues that we face in our city. And food policy is so complicated and so big um, we really need to give this a little bit of thought. The other thing is to establish a partnership. Um, and there are now all sorts of civil society organizations that are supporting cities to establish partnerships of what I'm calling food system change makers. So when you inevitably as policymakers are engaging um, stakeholders, you know that there are those that are going to want to block some of the changes that you implement. But you also know that there are those that are really forward thinking, totally understand the issues and are there to act and support. So it's really important to understand who those are. Um, I, I was thinking about this slide earlier on. It says learn about food system thinking. And actually we need to do that from the very top. We're all here together learning about food system thinking. 
But once you've established a partnership, collectively, it's important to learn about food system thinking. And um, in the introduction, for example, um, Florence mentioned that I'm involved in a Horizon 2020 project and some of my colleagues are online. So there's 11 cities in Europe that are going through this process. And actually we're learning about thinking and participatory approaches and engaging stakeholders together. Then we are equipped at that stage to begin drafting our food strategy and action plan or food policy actions, begin to start planning them. A, a very, very important thing at that stage also is to consult citizens and the stakeholders that you've involved. And hopefully citizens have been involved in that process too. So here are, is a list and I actually got it from a, um, a Michigan project. I was looking at who's, who's produced lists of the kind of stakeholders to involve. And some of them, yes, we, we, we would totally agree with, but actually what's interesting is from a city point of view, when we think about all those that are involved in food policy, some of us are working um, in health, for example, in public health, but those that are actually responsible for food policy span very many departments. And it's really important to think about who those people are. So it could be those involved in economic development, planning is very important, waste, advertising and regulation, they're, they're endless people. So you need to think about that. Local food producers include farmers, obviously street food vendors, vendors, micro food enterprises, those involved in the hospitality sector, market organizers. And again, it's not at this stage, it's not important to establish a stakeholder partnership of absolutely everybody, but to think about what it is that you're trying to achieve and who is most at time. I've also mentioned now um, emergency food. Most of us have had to think about emergency food planning during the pandemic. And we've realized that there's a whole new group of stakeholders to engage. Um, people who are involved in food banks, soup kitchen coordinators, community canteens, those that are also, I mentioned below, involved in food and social justice, the directors of social enterprises, for example. Finally, we mentioned food systems research. This is such a new area and the research needs to happen at the same time. So many of the projects we're involved with, including Food Cities 2022, we have great academics working with us and you'll meet some of them in, as I finish this. When you're establishing a multi-stakeholder partnership, I think um, I've, I've written a summary here that you can have a look at. One of the most important things is to assess the power and influence of those stakeholders. And, um, and Wageningen University, who's also a partner, partner on one of our projects, have actually developed a tool which visualizes that. And this also helps you understand who the blockers and the enablers are as well. Um, another key thing is to incorporate participatory methods and approaches, and you can use a whole um, range of methods. Um, we're going to cover some in the case studies, and I'm going to mention one which is exceptional as, a, as an example. I think, and this is something that I've started to think about even more, is the importance of listening and communication skills. And listening skills are very important. And actually there are now people globally who are publishing on what it means to listen effectively. But communication skills is also about when we've engaged people, how do we make sure that they understand that we're following through with what we have heard? And it's not always easy and it's actually not always, even though we'd think that in local government it is happening, it's not always something that does happen and so that's something very important to think about. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Yesterday um, at lunchtime we hosted a business lunch of um, quite large businesses in the city that I'm based in because there's now so much work going on. What we want to avoid is stakeholder fatigue and ensure that the businesses themselves do want to be contacted by us. And interestingly, every single business that was present in that meeting, and it, it says a lot that they actually turned up in the first place, said, yes, we do want to participate in um, your programs around food policy, but we want a clear roadmap and we need guide, we, we want to know that we're going to be taking part in some clear action. So they don't want to attend endless meetings. And after that, we also hosted our first in-person Living Lab Horizon 2020 meeting. 
And there's a GP, a doctor that has been part of very many stakeholder meetings over the past decade. And he did say to me at the end, I want to see that there's clear action coming from this. And so um, people do want to participate and engage, but there's also this need to communicate and to make sure that, that they can see that action is going to be taking place. So one of the best examples that I've seen of citizen and stakeholder engagement was um, the, the development of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And we've included this in a case study, as a case study in um, a document on smart nutrition cities, which we started ahead of the Bindi project, a partnership between Bur um, Birmingham in the UK, which is where I'm based in Pune in India, and you'll hear more about this. And they were absolutely incredible at engaging farmers, policymakers, citizens to discuss what the food policy objectives for the city should be. And they did this at scale. And then they actually also presented that to their city officials before um, they organized a consultation as well with citizens across all districts and before it was signed off. And it was a, it's a five-year plan they developed. And from that, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact came into action and our cities all over the globe are following that lead. So it's, it's just testament to what a fantastic stakeholder engagement, citizen engagement initiative that was. Um, now, many of you know about the UN Food System Summit, which is taking place in October and all states, nation states are expected to host national dialogues. We know that India has hosted a national dialogue. The UK is due to host a national dialogue and to present a report of what their national stakeholders are saying. But there's also an opportunity to host an independent dialogue, which will feed into the process too. And so um, I think there's gonna be an opportunity to learn more about that later on, but um, I've included a link because that also offers, the, 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 the Food Systems Summit Dialogue team are also offering training and support around how you do that. Finally, you're going to, now I'm going to pass on to my colleagues, um, um, Anjali and Bushana. And the Bindi story started off with engaging stakeholders in both Pune and Birmingham. And actually it was the, the, the nature of the international partnership, which really galvanized and accelerated, um, galvanized leadership support and accelerated commitment from stakeholders. And both cities decided that they wanted to focus on out of home food policies and practices. And we're still, apart from last year, obviously things had, have had an impact on the work. We're still moving forward together. And a big aspect of this was citizen engagement. Those of you in India and maybe elsewhere know that Pune is exceptional at citizen engagement and has used technology to engage citizens in decision and policy making processes and planning the city creating a vision for the city. And interestingly, we learned from that approach and we also conducted a survey based on the citizen engagement in Pune and that's what you're going to hear about now. So I'll end my presentation and over to you, um, Anjali. Uh, thank you, Charlene. So I'll just share my presentation. Is it visible, I guess? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so today I will be to, I'm Anjali and I'm from nutrition background, currently working at CCDC New Delhi on a food system project. And I will be presenting along with Bhushana about the study conducted in Pune about eating out of home. As you can see, multiple national and international partners were involved in this project. The main ones were Pune Municipal Corporation, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics and Food Foundation, along with LSHTM. So as Shalin has said, the main purpose was to provide data and evidence to make the food policies. We had two main objectives of the study. Uh, first one, to understand out of home eating practices. And second one, to consult the citizens about policy options for Pune Municipal Corporation. I will be presenting about the first one and Bhushana will present about the second one. Highlights of the uh, survey, this was a collaborative effort among policymakers and researchers. So this is a unique example where throughout the process of the study, Pune Municipal Corporation was actively involved from planning 
to execution to public engagement during this study we could do capacity building of the auxiliary nurse midwives who are part of pune municipal corporation and who collected data for this study this study formed a base for food policy work and we covered mainly following points we tried to understand about the frequency of eating out of home concept of healthy food of citizens drivers of food choices and expectations of pune citizens from the pune municipal corporation on the right hand side you can see a ward wise map of the pune there are 15 wards and we collected data from each ward representative ward about on th around 3000 participants uh from all socio economic strata around 50% of them were women uh the it was the data were collected using computer operated system and uh, we trained the health workers to do that the first slide shows the out of home eating practices of pune citizens as we can see uh, that more than once at least the out of home foods were consumed and the uh, population the, the people who consume these were mainly from younger uh, age and uh, so, uh, some of the foods were available across all the socio economic groups such as noodles and fried foods all these foods were easily available across all the strata out of total 14 meals out of in a week which they reported at least one was consumed out of home and mostly 72% pune citizens ordered the, these foods using apps like zomato or swiggy pune citizens know which foods are unhealthy so when we asked them which foods are healthy and which are unhealthy they accurately knew which are not healthy foods to consume we also try to understand what are the drivers of food choices and we could see that in the lower socio economic neighborhoods price state taste quality and healthy option were the drivers in the high socio economic group these drivers uh, the uh, priority of these drivers was other way round healthy option and quality were the first two ones i will hand it over to bhushana now uh thank you so much anjali thank you all the food foundation and uh, the persons who have joined the meeting uh we have tried to uh, uh, analyze what people to talked us one thing is very clear it is that pune citizens want to take very bold actions by pmc the more than 60% of the people who surveyed wanted more teaching of healthy eating in the school curriculum this was very important for us the second most another point that was made was that making fruit and vegetables more affordable affordable as you all know that fruit and vegetables have a very volatile prices they want to consume citizens want to consume but they want to make it more affordable third is that uh, the, the third is the tastier Uh, take home rations from anganwadi anganwadi is a scheme run by pmc which is a part of mid day meal schemes and uh, uh, citizens want that, those rations to be more tasty on the uh, unhealthy food on the uh, street, street food uh, next slide on the street food uh, side uh, we uh, you know there were two completely different options that were emerging uh, lower income group wanted street food to be safer uh, to be uh, safe to consume and they also want promotion of healthier street food because they want to make a healthier street food available for themselves while the middle income group went for the more of a regulatory function such as ban on unhealthy food tighter licensing and uh, more of a health and uh, safety certification for the street vendors uh, public programs which are the part of welfare food system for pmc again the major comment was that instead of in the tastier uh, they want a tastier take home anganwadi ration uh, more than uh, just a cereals and dals they want to include more of fruits and vegetables in the same uh, so we had a very uh, lively vibrant public engagement ceremony of the uh, our uh, report and it was very well received in by the newspapers and the media covered in pune thank you so we have kept our 5 minutes but you can ask us any questions uh, you want thanks
Fantastic, thank you. I have many questions, um, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A. And if you also have questions for um, any of uh, our last three speakers, please do put them in the chat box. Um, and we look forward to um, hearing more from you in the um, Q&A session. So I'm going to bring in our next speaker now. We have joining us from Nigeria, Mr. Opayemi Elujulo, who is Director of Partnerships and Strategic Visioning and Youth for the Environment in Nigeria. He's a trained ecologist working to advance climate actions, biodiversity conservation, agroecology, and youth mobilization for action in Nigeria and beyond. He's also the founder of Youth for the Environment in Nigeria, um, where he works to advance actions that reposition agriculture to the front line of climate actions and build the capacity for young people in green business. He participates and works in a very impressive number of projects and non-governmental organizations globally, and he does all of this whilst working as a student soil fertility researcher at the Federal University in Abaguta, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Elijulo, uh, for joining us, um, and over to you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Florence. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining uh, us from. Um, I'm happy to be sharing this platform with you all. And um, as a way of introduction, uh, my name, as it has been said, is um, Okwemi Lujulo. And I am the, uh, the convener of the Forty Farm Dialogue um, here in New York State in Nigeria. And as it has been said, I'm a postgraduate researcher and um, food security researcher as well. Um, yeah, so um, to start off the uh, discussion, um, I have started with an underlying scope of uh, what the food strategy um, is all about, uh, which according to uh, Metro Vancouver uh, says, um, the food system strategy envisions uh, a food system uh, that does not um, only contribute to the well-being um, of all people involved, but uh, delivers on other uh, benefits, uh, including uh, the economic prosperity of the region and also um, conserves uh, the aesthetics and the values of the environment and, um, of course, the ecological um, legacy. Um, so uh, the food system strategy in Nigeria, um, which um, is designed to address the uh, the menace of hunger and um, also combat the malnutrition. Um, in Nigeria currently, um, about 2 million people um, are currently challenged with um, severe acute uh, malnutrition. And um, also, to, also to address um, is the um, associated uh, food um, diet related diseases and also to address the rural poverty. And this um, food system strategy in Nigeria is being coordinated under um, a recently launched um, national poverty reduction and good strategy, as, as well as the uh, nutrition uh, policy. And that's um, a brief insight into uh, what the food system strategies in Nigeria uh, looks like. And um, then the question of why cities need food strategy uh, came to mind. And, of course, one thing would be because our current food system is vulnerable to, sh to, to shock. Uh, one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic um, literally brought our attention to is the vulnerability of our food system to shock. Um, at the point during the, 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 the pandemic now, uh, people, I mean, countries all over the world, majority of countries all over the world had to go into um, lockdown. And this uh, clearly showed how the people at the, um, um, at, at, at the front, I mean, position um, of the food chain, the farmers now uh, are faced challenge with their lives and livelihood. Uh, you know, they, they faced challenge with assessing labor, with assessing materials, and also getting their produce uh, to the market, among others, which resulted in wastage. And um, same for the consumers as well, who couldn't go out to um, obtain their food and, um, I mean, faced with hunger. and. That um, a show of how vulnerable our uh, food system, the current food system is. And another concern would be um, of that of the growing cities and um, the, the, the growing food insecurity. Um, currently, though, um, the, 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 the hard flow of people from the rural um, environment to the urban to, to the urban center to cities now uh, is largely increasing the, the challenge with food security in the urban. Um, 
center and uh, this uh, demand for um, a rethink of the food system and, and to, to improve the accessibility and affordability of this food uh, towards, you know, feeding the, the, the Timmy population, uh, which the food that we eat is still very much a question. And uh, currently, um, over half of the population reside in the city, and by 2050, over 60% are expected to, to be resident there. That begs the question of what will this Timmy population eat? And then another would be to improve the, the, the access to adequate and afford, affordable healthy food uh, in a way that is just and fair for all. Um, currently, we believe that um, we, we produce more than we can consume, but over 800 million people across the world are still faced with um, the issues of hunger, and that again begs for a, a, a rethink of the food system. And the current food system is also, of course, the, the contribution to the climate and ecological crisis of the current food system also begs for um, food strategies that are able to deliver on multiple uh, benefits of addressing the food security issues, addressing the climate crisis, and also uh, alleviating poverty as well. And of course, the current food system is also not inclusive of all stakeholders in the food and farming uh, space. Of course, we would understand the farming system to be inclusive of actions ranging from uh, getting off the inputs to, to planting, to varying of these animals, to transportation, you know, uh, to, to, to processing, to selling of this, and even to consumption and to the disposal. So uh, the current food system uh, is not really representative of these um, diverse stakeholders, uh, I mean, in, in the formulation of policies that guides and intervention uh, prescribed for it. And this has not allowed for the delivery of the food system uh, in quality and quantity of the sub, uh, the, the set um, objectives. And uh, this, this, this right here, uh, talk about the, the disparities in food availability uh, that are persisted, you know, through, through the COVID um, season, which of course is still um, very much realities uh, in different countries of the world. And this again reemphasizes the need um, for a food uh, strategy uh, that, that delivers uh, the set objectives and multiple uh, benefits as well. Uh, so, and then um, Thing would be uh, what food strategy uh, are we talking about that might deliver on food system? And um, of the resilience analysis identified by uh, Mew Wilson et al. in 2019, uh, so this food strategy that should be developed must be one that uh, is resilient and then should be able to address these five steps of the first one being resilient to what? Resilience of what, sorry? and that of the farming system um, to a number of factors, which could be uh, from the social economy uh, to, to, to the political, to environmental factors. Uh, many farming system, many farming practices, farming approaches in, in, in developing countries of Africa are largely rainfed and which automatically put uh, farmers at a disadvantage in the dry season. So adaptability of this farming system, the resilience of these two um, environmental factors to political factor uh, should be um, one that is likely considered uh, in, in, in food strategy uh, development and implementation. Then resilience to what? And, and that, that would be uh, resilience to challenges, which of course, again, could be environmental, economic, and uh, social, as well as institutional. And resilient for what purpose? And uh, the primary function, um, the overall aim of the, the food system uh, of a food strategy uh, is to ensure uh, a sustainable and nutrition sensitive food system uh, that, that, that also conserves the aesthetics and values of the ecological um, system. And so um, this function uh, should be such that uh, it, 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 it's resilient, the strategy should be such that it is resilient to be able to deliver on these functions of um, making private or public goods um, available uh, to the masses. And then the next one being resilient capacities. And that talks about the robustness, the adaptability to some of these um, changes and then transformability uh, as the changes might be. And then the, the attributes that enhances resilience that helps the food um, system to, 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 to be um, resilient. And of course, that would be diversity, openness, tightness, uh, the system um, reserves and the other one there. So 
Um, then what food system, uh, what food strategies would now deliver? That's the continuation from wrestling, the first one being resilience. And the second one is trust must be its foundation. Um, the, the, the level of this trust between um, farmers and I mean people along the food chain is um, to a large extent, and this has largely affected the food system. The farmers not trusting the cities and the cities not trusting the farmers to deliver on promises and interventions. That has really been um, a major challenge to um, a food system that delivers multiple um, benefits and also partnerships oriented, it should be partnership oriented. And that's because uh, the food policy currently uh, have been shared among different ministries who most times are not aligned in their priorities. And this affects the development of um, interventions and strategies that deliver the set objectives. And it also should be inclusive and representative of our stakeholders across the food uh, value chain. And then of course, backed with policy and supported with other levels of change. Um, incentivizing and um, education uh, to change the behavior and perspective of people has been shown largely to, 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 to support behavioral change and change the narrative of um, undesirable circumstances. So this should also uh, be considered in developing a food strategy. And it, it should also aim to address the trial challenges of food security, the climate crisis, and as well as poverty. So um, for the past nine months, um, Youth for the Environment in partnership with um, Norwich Scotland and a host of other organizations um, across the globe from 20 countries um, of the world have been um, coordinating this um, dialogue and consultation with farmers and city representatives to improve the school system. And that's we call the Fox to Farm Dialogue. And this is an approach that we see to be really um, desirable to transform the food system and better position us for uh, improved accessibility and affordability of food, uh, both in quality and quantity, of course. And this um, fork to farm dialogue stems from the assumption that both cities and farmers uh, feel that food and farming can be done in a way that delivers some multiple benefits, including across, uh, addressing the interconnectedness of nature, of climate, nature, and um, health emergencies. Uh, one thing we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic is how swift the um, local and city actors, I mean, representative stood up to respond to uh, the crisis and see how we can come out of it. And this shows that um, city representatives and all the stakeholders in the, value, in, in the food value chain, if empowered, can really um, help address these um, food system issues. And also understand that a just transition it also stems, uh, the fourth to farm dialogue also understand that a just transition in food and farm is needed for both the cities and farmers. And cities here represent every other person along the value chain contributor to uh, the food system and also local and city representatives, uh, political representatives and farmers represent the diversity of uh, people engaged in food and farming inclusive of the um, the, 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 the headers, inclusive of the crop producers and poultry farmers, among others. And the, the interesting thing about the Fork to Farm Dialogue is it's, it's focused on building lasting relationships because we see this as the foundation where partnership can be built. And partnership, we believe, is strongly essential uh, in a food um, strategy, not just between ministries, not just among ministries, but also um, other stakeholders in the uh, food chain. And uh, it also sees the need to strengthen trust between urban and rural actors in food uh, system. And the website there is, um, if you would like to um, learn more about the uh, Fox to Farm uh, dialogue. And this is part of the consultation that we've had uh, over some of the images from the consultations we've had over the past um, six months. And um, we, we realized the need to engage in person in, uh, at the community level, at the grassroots level, uh, to the farmers that we are connected to, to the um, city representatives, to seed um, producers, to um, impute providers in the agriculture space, and also 
um, with the uh, city and state representatives of those that, that are involved in formulation of policies and interventions uh, targets at um, food and famine. And this right there, um, uh, the picture right there is was when we were delivering the communique of a dialogue that we've had uh, to the chairman committee on agriculture and rural development in New York State, who are better positioned for uh, policy and decision making. And this is just part of the project. The project still continues bringing together diverse stakeholders in the food and value chain to deliberate and uh, discuss amidst themselves. And for us to know how best we can all work together to really transform uh, the food system. We believe the small scale farmers can learn from the large scale farmers and the large scale farmer also has a lot to learn from the small scale farmer and other actors in the food uh, and farming space. And yeah, that'll be all. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, back to you now, Florian. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elijula. It's really, really interesting to, to see your work. Um, I'd love to hear more at some point about, you know, what sort of, um, what came out from that consultation, what it was that the, the farmers were, were trying to communicate with the cities and, um, and what was in that communique, which is, was great to see that uh, practical document being handed over with all those findings in it. So I'm going to bring in our final speaker now. Pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Pulkit Matar, who is the head of the Department of Food and Nutrition at Lady Irwin College at the University of Delhi. She's the current president of the Nutrition Society of the India Delhi chapter and is an active member of NetProfan, which she's going to be telling us about today. And she's also a member of the National Committee of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences and an executive committee member of the Association of Food Scientists and Technologists of the India Delhi chapter. Thank you so much, Pulkit, over to you. Yeah, hi, thanks. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, they are. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for inviting me today to speak to you about NetProfan how, and how this network is engaging stakeholders as well as citizens under the Eat Right India initiative of the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. The Eat Right India movement stands on three pillars that is, eat safe, eat healthy as well as eat sustainable. We understand that addressing interlinked challenges of malnutrition and food safety would require a 360 degree approach to food systems. And hence we have established a number of network of which NetProfan is one of them. Professionals in food, nutrition and science play a key role in implementing the Eat Right India initiatives. This is because they have a huge body of knowledge and experience, which imparts credibility to the messaging. As trusted influencers in the local community, they are best placed to nudge a social and behavioral change towards safe and wholesome food habits. The pan-India presence of these professionals and their associations also enables us, you know, that physical outreach to each and every corner of the country. So this net fan is actually a collective of professional bodies, which includes the Indian Dietetic Association, Nutrition Society of India, Indian Medical Association, and associations which include food technologists, culinary experts, analytical chemists, and public health professionals. Currently, there are about 32 chapters of uh, NetProfan, which are spread over uh, nearly the entire country, covering about 18 states and union territories. Now, each professional organization has its own vision, mission objectives, and they have been performing activities according to that. These activities currently are not coordinated. They're kind of happening in isolation of each other. So what this network does really is to provide a platform where people can pool their synergies, actually pool their strengths. And this complements whatever are the existing government programs and services. This network also provides a momentum to the Eat Right India movement, which has been launched. This network has the power to reach a variety of audiences, whether they are professionals, they are academicians, or they are the general public, even in rural areas. Objectives of NetProfan include first and foremost, the growth and development of the professional associations and their members. And this is what really attracts them to this network. But of course, the objective is also to support and expand 
the outreach of the public programs to promote public health, nutrition, and food safety. And that is what these organizations have been independently trying to do. The third objective is to establish collaborative linkages for knowledge sharing, for capacity building, and for consumer empowerment. Net Profan is envisaged as a self-sustaining model. It is functional at the national, state, as well as city levels. And this helps because then we are able to address local needs and issues rather than you know, planning only at the central level. There is a two-tier steering committee. One is at the national level and the other is at the state level. Each chapter has its convener and co-convener who are elected. There is a reward system in place also, and this kind of encourages members to, you know, really uh, participate in uh, different kinds of activities in promoting Eat Right India. There is a host of sources which we, are, we have available, and uh, the best one is, of course, the manifesto, which is a very well-written document, and this really helps to guide all the members uh, you know, about the key themes and the different kinds of activities that they can undertake. There is a website where members can then upload their activities and earn points. And then, of course, there are quarterly meetings in which they can showcase their achievements to others to replicate. The network commits to six key themes of action. These include safe food, combating food adulteration, healthy diets, food fortification, nutrition during the first thousand days, and no food waste. And all these are aligned to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Now, how do we go about uh, at the local level, at the local city level, how do we make these people the game changers? The members are supposed to contact the local food safety department and know about what are the eat right initiatives that have been undertaken by the administration. They can then select and adopt programs which are to be implemented in their district and identify different stakeholders and partners who will help them. They organize meetings, webinars, whatever the activity entails, formulate a rollout plan and implement it with defined timelines. And there's a system of monitoring and assessment, and this helps to fill any gaps that they may uh, come across in the program. They also need to document their success stories and then share so that others can replicate their models. The kinds of activities conducted are content creation, training and capacity building, mass dissemination, and outreach activities. Now, content creation is important because we need that reliable source of information for everybody as to what is healthy, what is safe, and what is sustainable. The local chapters help in the translation of the content into regional languages, and region-specific local seasonal recipes are also provided by them. If you know India, you will know that every few kilometers you go, the cuisine also changes and so does the language. So this contribution by local chapters is indeed very, very important. Under training and capacity building, I'm sharing with you some of these photographs, which are of different events which have happened in different cities. This is a picture of a chef consultation which happened in Mumbai. And you can see by the huge numbers of the number of people who are into this movement and into participating and trying to create a better food safety ecosystem. These are pictures from Bhubaneswar, which is a city in Orissa. And these are of, I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but they are, we've just tried to put in a lot of pictures together. There are students, there are frontline workers, there are professionals, and there are webinars and meetings, and also uh, sensitization workshops done to uh, train and build their capacities on what are the real issues that they need to focus on. This is another picture from Madhya Pradesh where dietitians are being trained and a picture from Jharkhand where a student uh, participated in activities. This is uh, from Punjab, food handlers and food industries being trained uh, so that they ensure fo safe food. And this, I don't know how many of you know that FSSAI actually provides these, uh, it's called food safety on wheels. These are vans which are provided to all the states. And uh, the states can then in turn, you know, send it to small cities and even rural areas. And these vans then serve the purpose of sensitizing uh, the people in uh, to different issues of food safety as well as healthy eating. There's a little lab which is built into these uh, this van 
And so, you know, they can test local samples. So people can bring their local food samples and get them tested here for food fraud or food adulteration. These are some pictures of mass dis dissemination activities of schools and, uh, you know, many schools covered uh, in uh, Punjab. So Chandigarh, this is a picture from Chandigarh. These are only a few pictures of, you know, of uh, kinds of activities done. This is a, a quiz session which was done with the general public just to engage them and to get them, start, you know, thinking about what really is healthy. So questions like, you know, what do you think? Do you think this is healthy? Do you think what, what would be healthier if you eat that? So uh, things which would engage them and would get them thinking. These are again some pictures from Jaipur and pictures from Raipur. This was a really interesting camp that they put up where they displayed the local seasonal uh, healthy foods and recipes made from that uh, for the general public. Outreach activities, especially our eat, eat Right Melas. Melas are big fairs which are organized where uh, they have been able to touch like 10 lakh citizens through these uh, Melas. And these have been in Barpeta district, Mumbai, Indore, Chennai, Raipur, of course, Delhi too. And uh, so a lot of stalls on display, street foods, how street foods can be safe as well. Uh, what are the alternate you know, healthy recipes which people should ch uh, choose from? Now, what, uh, how do we encourage the local uh, government bodies and how are they nudged into being a part of this Eat Right India movement? So recently what was launched was the Eat Right uh, Challenge in which the heads of municipal bodies and districts uh, were invited to participate in this Eat Right Challenge. And uh, basically they were given a list of goals and activities that they had to achieve if they registered. And it was believed that through regulatory activities, the social behavior change, communication, food safety compliance, and preventive healthcare can be ensured. And this would assist in actually strengthening the food safety system through food regulatory environment, provision of safe and healthier food options to citizens, engagement of citizens for adoption and demanding healthier diets through social and behavior change. Um, the innovative practices received special financial funding, so that was the role of the center. Uh, also, these cities then got to brand themselves and got special uh, recognition. This is ongoing, so we don't have the outcomes all out as yet. Of course, FSSAI also supports by, uh, you know, a huge body of resources. Uh, we have e-resources, uh, books, manuals, guidance notes, uh, websites for each of these, uh, uh, you know, initiatives. There's a, a library of different videos which can be disseminated among the public. There are panel agencies, master trainers who help in capacity building. This is a glimpse of some of those books uh, which have been written by Net for Fan members. And uh, they are now a part of the whole set of resources. So 55 plus books, 50 plus brochures, 100 flyers, and a whole host of li uh, video library that can be used uh, by NetProfan members. There is also a NetProfan newsletter, which is taken out in which uh, chapters share their activities. And that helps you know, the others to get an idea, oh, we can also do this. So thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matua. That was really interesting. So uh, interesting to see how you can use that network of, uh, of, of nutritionists and professionals to really influence interventions and, and policy within a city. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to put to our speakers? Please feel free to raise your hands if you um, have something you'd like to ask. I would like to, to uh, start off with a question to all of our speakers. I mean, there's there's going to be so many interesting findings that come from these um, engagement practices. Um, have you got any any great examples of how these findings have been implemented within a city to to actually really change the approach um, and the strategy within cities? And there's there's almost certainly going to be many conflicts and um, that, that come up along the way between different interests within a city food system. How have these conflicts risen up, and how have they been reconciled? Would anyone of our speakers like to come in um, to comment on, on that at all? I'm happy to kick off. Thank you, Charlene. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> Pune to me is an excellent example of um, just following the process of stakeholder and citizen engagement. 
And then they quickly secured funding from the World Bank to implement a whole series of policy actions, which I believe they're now um, doing. And so, for example, even when we visited, um, we were introduced to co-ops, um, a cooperative and farmers markets, which are now, there are now plans for to roll across the city. And that in definitely responds to the, the kind of policy recommendations that citizens have made. Um, so yeah, that, we're still learning from Pune. So it's interesting that, you know, this is a UK based, the Food Foundation is a UK based organization, but even from day one, we made it clear that we were learning, we were, we were setting up this partnership program to learn from other cities across the world. Um, so, and I hope that others will too. Um, the other great example, obviously, is Milan. And I urge everybody to read that case study. Um, and because their stakeholder engagement led to a citywide food policy, which now that process is being adopted by cities all over the world and all regions. So um, for me, those are the two good examples which relate to the presentation. In terms of conflicts, I'm going to pass that on. There are lots of conflicts, but let's give somebody else a chance to speak. I wonder about Phuket. Thank you very much. Hi. So uh, I'll take it up from there and talk about the conflicts. So uh, there is, you know, a huge problem when you're trying to, you know, tell people or even get people, nudge people to change eating habits. Uh, so the, it's an interplay of the food supplier and, you know, what is in demand. So if you talk to the, uh, you know, the restaurants or the people who are, uh, you know, selling food on the streets as to how can they, you know, reduce the fat or the sugar or the salt, and they'll just throw up their hands and say, no, that will, you know, cut our customer base. So it's a big struggle to get them to change. And then if you talk to the consumer, the consumer just throws up and says, uh, what do I do if I'm going out? I have to eat the food that is available. So, you know, that getting the two to actually uh, talk to each other and say, okay, as a consumer, why don't you demand this? If you demand, then the, there will be a supply for it. And on the other side, why don't you offer one alternative to the consumer and see if it does well in terms of sale? Because th this is a big conflict, which is always there. Just, you know, with ready to eat food, as well as with packaged food, because they, you know, there's always this uh, struggle with the industry as to the, you know, th them throwing up the hand saying nothing can be done, we cannot reduce, right? So uh, yes, the you know regulatory authorities are there and they're going to push them and they're going to nudge them, but this conflict is actually very difficult to solve. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I wonder um, if Elojula El is still with us. If there's any conflict that's arisen, arisen between um, the, the asks of the of the farming community in the rural um, areas um, in conflict with with the urban agenda. Um, yeah, I think um, the conflict I would like to um, relate with here would be um, at the uh, producers level, at the food producers, you know, between the crop producers and then the headers you now. Uh, which is something that has been going on um, for a long time now in Nigeria between uh, crop producers and then the cattle uh, rearers now. Uh, the cattle, uh, the headers now want open grazing and uh, most of the time uh, the cattle would wander into the crop farm and then consume all the uh, crops of the farmers and this has really uh, uh, led to, to a lot of um, issues, loss of lives and properties. And um, this um, has been tried to be um, addressed by, by a system called uh, RUGA, uh, which is Rural Grazing Area, uh, just um, to designate um, a settlement for uh, cattle um, across the states. Uh, but the, the issue is the problem is uh, people in the southern part of the country are concerned about this happening because of the level of insecurities um, uh, being perpetrated, I mean, the atrocity being perpetrated by uh, some of these, um, um, uh, I, I, I'm trying to choose my word carefully now, but uh, this, this insecurity, this insecurity challenge is there and this has led to a lot of conflict and um, the, the RUGA seems to be the best option that is really uh, being explored at the moment to really address this challenge and this has largely contributed to the challenge with food security because 
the crop producers hardly go to the farm to, to, to produce in, in the field for their lives and properties. And if the farmers don't get to go to the field to produce their crops, the crop farmers now, that means the supply to the uh, cities um, is be will become greatly reduced. And that's what we've been experiencing. But uh, the option of Ruga is still currently being explored. And uh, we are seeing some green lights that this might become uh, a thing, which this also came up um, a lot of time when we met with uh, both the cities as well as the farmers uh, during our consultation. And what the farmers are now saying, uh, the crop farmers now, what they are now saying might be the best option is to uh, ban open grazing and then uh, as much as possible and as fast as possible see to the implementation of um, the rural, um, the, the grazing area now, which is being explored. Great, I know that's such a, a powerful example of how important these dialogues are to really understand what's going on for all different stakeholders and to work together to, to come up with these solutions that are practical and that work for everyone within a strategy. Um, Anjali, we have a hand yeah. up. Uh, I would just like to add, uh, yeah, Shaleen already mentioned about the Pune Urban Food Pilot uh, by supported by World Bank. I was uh, part of it. So I would rather talk about the uh, conflict resolution, uh, how we are trying to uh, make it. So we have designed an intervention in Pune City where we are training farmers for the sustainable agriculture and the same produce will be sold for that we have engaged with the organized retail shops and we are keeping some uh, separate place for the sustainable agriculture and whatever the difference between uh, you know the extra pay how much people are consumers are willing to pay more to the farmers with the certification and uh, what is exactly the cost that uh, gap funding will be taken care of by the government or some other instruments. That's what we are planning. Uh, I just gave it as an example for the conflict resolution uh, between the two stakeholders, like because sustainable agriculture is uh, more costly. Mm, how much? Right. But, yeah. Fantastic. So if I understood correctly, um, that was a, a, an example of how that, that engagement process not only was a way of um, engaging stakeholders to, to kind of look at what needs to go into the strategy, but also to create those connections to work forward as partners in the future in the delivery of the strategy. Exactly. Institutional mechanism to uh, compress the value chains from sustainable farmers to the Pune citizens because they want healthy food and uh, directly from farmers for that. Great. Right. There's a lot of crossover between um, the initial engagement when you're creating your strategy and also we've talked a lot about partnerships and we've got a whole other webinar in two webinars time about working as partners and then finally our, our seventh webinar is about growing the food, food movement and it's you'll, you'll find that there's many of those same stakeholders that you're engaging throughout the process that are, are part of all of these different elements of the, the creation and the delivery of the strategy um, so lots of interesting crossover that brings us very neatly to the end of our session. Um, next, uh, the next webinar we have in uh, two weeks time on the 18th of August, we're going to be looking at data and information and how we use uh, mapping techniques um, to really understand your city, your site to make your strategy really, really uh, location specific. So we hope uh, you'll join us on the 18th. As usual, I will send a follow up email with a recording, with our presentations and with a link to register for our next webinar. Thank you so much, um, as ever, for joining us today. I hope you found it informative um, and it's a pleasure to have had you all. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us and we'll see you in two weeks time. Very best. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>